How are you? <laughs> We're good. Thank you, Tom. How are you, hold, are you holding up all right? Yeah, pretty good, you know? Yeah. It's an interesting uh, thing to have you both here. I'm still not quite used to it yet. I've been talking <laughs> to everybody over Zoom, you know? I guess you're a little less used to it than we've been playing shows. And we've been playing all manner of shows since the middle of the summer. And recently, you know, theater or arena shows. And so it, it doesn't seem that unusual to me. Yeah, it feels like you're coming in on a weekend. Yeah. Greg, I saw your post on Instagram the other day of um, the, the, the meeting of you guys, the right. North Toronto Collegiate, Collegiate Institute. Institute. What, what do you remember from that? Oh, oh this story's been told too many <laughs> times. <laughs> I don't, Jim, I don't, do you mind? Uh, I don't mind. Please. I haven't heard the story before, go Greg. Ahead. Um, I was a new boy. Oh, it's a complicated story. Okay. Um, I was a new boy, and I came at the end of the school year after March break to North Toronto from Montreal. Okay. And I didn't really like Toronto and I wasn't really interested in making friends. And then in the math class, <laughs> Mr. The guy who looked like a beaver, I can't remember his name. No chance. Anyways, I was sitting there in the back in math class and Jim and Susan Lowndes and some other <laughs> friend of ours, you know, I'm not yet, I was yet to be a friend. They were passing notes back and forth. And, uh, you know, I'm watching this and at the end of it, Susan Lowndes takes the notes, tears them up, and puts them in the trash can. And so I wait till all the class is left. I go in, I get the notes, and I put them back together on the desk. And they're talking about Leroy Newboy, and that was me. And they're talking about my suede topsiders. So I just sort of made a little mental note. <laughs> they're, they're making fun of you a little bit. Yes, they're, yeah, yeah right. the, the new kid. Then the next year, I tried out for the football team, and I was on the senior side. And Jim was the quarterback for the junior side, and you won a city championship that no, year. No, we were only made it to the quarterfinals, but thank you. You didn't get... No, we had injuries, so... The ring? We, could, we should have. Hey, I got to tell you, it does not sound like you're over it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, you have to go on with the story, because yeah. so, <laughs> greater humiliation is ahead. We were, the, the juniors would scrimmage against the seniors, and so I played defensive end, and... Um, Jim was throwing a pass, and just before he let go, I nailed him from the blind side. And that's, you're not supposed to do that, you know, in, in scrimmages. But against juniors. Against juniors. And so he got up and he started cursing me out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I grabbed him by the face mask, and I threw him to the ground. And that was our sort of first meeting, our encounter. And, and I've been trying to get back at him ever since. Yeah, right. So I, right. Made him, I made him my partner and made his life miserable and wore him out. As I said, that's what post. you see. See, I'm doing pretty good. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Did you into, like? Were you buddies right after that? Or you know what? We ran in the same crowd. Yeah. And and we we gradually became friends. Of course. I mean, Greg was a pretty interesting guy to come to to Toronto because he was a he was a, a, a renowned goalie. You know, a sort of a junior A goalie, and he he came in, but he was a very disaffected athlete. He didn't really <laughs> want to be an athlete. So when he came out for the school team, he just was uh, he just would toy with every with everybody, and, and so it was he was uh, like he is. He was a mixed blessing. <laughs> <laughs> and you relate to the guitar, weren't you? I was yeah. I, I was uh, well. I guess it would have been like seventy. Jim and his friends always played guitar. I always found it very inspiring. Right. But I was very self-conscious, and it, it was impossible impossible for me to creak out any sort of melody out of my throat. The self-conscious was, was so bad. But then I finally uh, started playing guitar in Lake Louise when I was around 20 or 21. And I bought my first guitar. I was working on the Great Lake Freighters, and we stopped in Three Rivers, Trois Rivières, sorry. And um, I bought a, a white Ibanez because Jim had a black Ibanez. <laughs> <laughs> Junior and senior. Uh -huh. <laughs> and were you, did you take to it right away or were you? I wrote a song that night. Yeah. On the boat in my little cabin. And it's one of those moments in life, you know, I just, it was one of those, uh, I wrote, I, it was such, I, the song started coming out of me and I couldn't believe it. Like, where is this coming from? And I sat down at my little table in my, in my cabin, and I wrote this little letter, manifesto to myself about this is what I had to do. And I had to surround myself with people that did this. And I wasn't even sure what it was, because up until that point, I was pretty much a dedicated, you know, sort of jockey sort of guy. Yeah. And that's when it sort of changed. So, and then it, it kind of changes. I want to play the first song we're going to play for you today. Just, just take a listen to this. Never tease me, you try to please me, I know you're always there, and it's true, 
It's true. It's true. From 1980, that is a single currently kept fetching $190. <laughs> wow. on, if you have it in near mint condition on Discogs, I Don't Know Why You Love Me by the Hi Fives, the first band to feature my guest Jim Cuddy and Greg Keeler, better known as, as Blue Rodeo. So what did you think when you heard that now? <laughs> well, you know what? It was, it was the first flush of success uh, before a, a prolonged period of failure because that that single, I mean, we, we made those really quickly. I think we were with Dave Booth at the time, who was our manager, mm -hmm. uh, Daddy Cool, uh, DJ, and uh, it got on Q107. I mean, we were interviewed by, believe it or not, we were interviewed by John Derringer, who's still the morning man. And Bob uh, Mackowitz. And Bob Mackowitz brought us in because he was the music director then. And, and that was, you know, we thought, wow, this this is an easy gig. We just do a song and it gets on the radio. Yeah. And then, of course, things things changed and it took us a long time to get back to that, 10 years. Is that, is that when you moved to New York after that? 81. 81, we moved to New York. Why did uh, you move to New York? Well, it seemed that everything was sort of drying up here. In 78, there were a lot of bars like The Turning Point and The Edge and The Horseshoe and other bars and record companies. Greg, how did New York go? New York was a blast. Yeah. New York was unbelievable. It was, it was sort of like music school and just sort of urban school. It's crazy to walk those streets and whether it be rock and roll or literature and you're, you know, you're hanging up on that park on the, on the Upper West Side where, where Holden would watch the ducks in the pond and, or you're down at the, the, the place where Dylan Thomas drank himself to death and you're going, I can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't this like feeling of I don't know. Like I think, I think when the first time I went to New York, I was so excited because it felt like real life. Like it felt like the stuff I had seen on TV was happening in front of me. You know, right. I'm in Newfoundland, right? So I don't know if I've ever told you guys that before, but I'm from Newfoundland. <laughs> and you know, um, over and over. The, <laughs> and, you know, when I got out there, I was like, oh, this is the set of Law and Order. Like this is the. the and then I went down to the East Village. Oh no, to the West Village, and I saw like the Gaslight where Dylan played, and I saw like where the Clancy Brothers played, and all that kind of. I stuff. I know it's incredible. But I also had a moment of, oh, it was just a place. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, but I think if you, you know, when you live there and you feel some familiarity with it, you realize that anything's possible in that. I mean, it is that, that, that the great irony is anything's possible and nothing's possible. I mean, it was the worst place to start a band. But we had such a great time. We were, we were meeting musicians. We were playing. But who wants to see a new band when every band in the world tours through there and on any given night, there's 20 opportunities to see something great. So for a new band, it's very difficult to get your, to get your foot in the door. So but everything's possible. Every, but like, it's a lot easier to talk to A&R guys in New York than it was to talk in it's Canada. It's easier to get a rejection slip in it's New York. It's easier to get a full rejection, <laughs> but you get it face to face. So you come back to Toronto and there's, there's something kind of happening on, on Queen West. And this is sort of like the formation of Blue Rodeo. You go to Queen West and this is sort of coming from the clubs there. Well, if you think that I didn't love you And if you think I was too cruel well, I was always there when you needed me If I'm so wrong, put the blame on me Put the blame on me yeah, yeah, yeah. Put the blame on me So I, I didn't know the Handsome Ned story No? No, I didn't, it was, it was before me And I didn't know until I was doing research for this How important he was oh, yeah. to the story of you guys to the story of like Queen West and Toronto being a place of this particular, our particular brand of, of, of country music, mm -hmm. if I can insert myself in there. Jim, yeah. did Jim, tell me a little bit about Handsome Ned. Well, Queen West was, a, was an abandoned place because by the time we left, the horseshoe was, I don't know, they were running talent nights and there was nothing happening. So it was, it was, it was just an abandoned stretch. I mean, it had Barney's the diner and it had a few things, the Lakeview diner, but it was- Bookstores, hardware book stores. Bookstores, but it was, it was just, it was low rent, uh, low rental uh, retail. The the Horseshoe Tavern re rejuvenated itself, and specifically the Cameron, because the Cameron was a live-in uh, hotel or, you know, apartments. Yeah. And uh, and Handsome Ned came and reinvented himself because I used to work with him out w when he was Robin Messick, and uh, he was Handsome Ned. He reinvented himself as this neo. Uh, a uh, traditional country guy, a uh, badass. And for some reason, it was the, he was just the tip of the iceberg. All these people that had been in punk bands had been sort of learning this Lost Highway music and the Lost Highway traditions. And they came out in gear. And when we came back, 
that scene was, we, we had already decided to be Blue Rodeo because that was more natural to us. And we came back into a scene in which we fit perfectly. <laughs> we had no idea. Hold on. So yeah, that's not the how I heard it. I always How'd heard you that you guys came back as punks from New York no. and got into country music again here. That's not, the, that's not it. Well, a little bit. Well, I guess, but we knew what we, we had, were doing. We, we, were, had, we had, hinted at country, but we didn't really focus on it till then. I wouldn't say that we were country, but we were, but our roots thing, which is what you would be, consider yeah. yourself part of, we were very much roots. And we had rejected all, all the music that we used to go see in New York in the, in the mid, the early eighties. New age. It, well, it was just, it just wasn't for us. It just wasn't right. So we were playing aggressive, rootsy rock country. And the country thing certainly, I think the country thing for us did not come from Handsome Ned as much as it came from Basil Donovan. Because Basil That's Donovan became our, our bass player and he'd played in country bands since he was uh, 17 years old. Oh, so Basil didn't go to New York. No. no, no, no. Basil went to New York later, but that was just with the with Blue Rodeo. But no, it was just Greg and I in New York with a whole other band. And when we when we made our last demo, we made it with a band called the Drongos. We were a New Zealand band that were hiding out in in New York, and uh, that became the the uh, uh, core of what what Blue Rodeo was. Because uh, the songs on that demo, which was initially rejected very funnily by Warner Music, because they were were they going after. Uh, Colin and Harder Rock Touring Acts. Yeah. No, Honeymoon Suite. Honeymoon Suite, point. yeah. Honeymoon Suite. And you've never let them forget it. Well, I mean, there is, there's <laughs> like the first five songs on a record are on the demo. So, but that was, that was different because that, you know, what Handsome Dead did was he created a scene that was self-contained. Yeah. Everybody looked after each other. Everybody helped each other. Everybody played with each other. And except for Handsome Ned, nobody cared about record companies. Nobody cared about manager. I remember our manager came up to us and said, oh, you know, I manage, we have no interest in a manager. We came back completely rejecting the whole idea of pursuing that because we'd just done that for three years in New York and didn't seem worth it to do it in Toronto. You just wanted to be part of a scene. Yeah, but there was a great scene. People, it is amazing to be full. part of a scene. Yeah. You yeah. know, as you well know. Yeah. You know, when you're, when you're accepted into that, it's a, it's, it's a cozy little place to drink, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> how, were you, how were you for writing songs in that style? Right off well, the Well, I think we came to it pretty quickly. You know, we, we've always just been fascinated with writing songs. And uh, I think that there's something rebellious about a lot of country music. And we identified with that. And there's something very sort of sincere about country music. And so that was nice too, you know. And, and when you say country music, you know, like it's such a wide uh, term to use, you know, because Ned was very much like an Austin, Texas sort of influenced yeah. country guy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that our country music influences might have been a little more rocky and it took us a while to get to the sweet finesse of Merle Haggard and Lefty Frisell and that sort of stuff. All that lovely stuff. I want to play the big hit. Take a listen to this. Every time you walk in the room I could ever be sure of a smile You would never I'm falling in love Oh, night after night Oh, it's crazy so That is Blue Rodeo and Try, the band's first top ten single in Canada. Outskirts comes out. Try is on it. Try is not the single. <laughs> what are the months like? <laughs> between the record coming out, which I think was supposed to be a big record for you guys. Yeah, I don't know. And think, try hitting. Like, what was, what were yeah. those, what was that time? Like? I, listen, I honestly think that our record company had, signed us because Joanne Kading was so into us and she was a publicity person and because there were always lineups at the bars for all of the bands on Queen Streets. So they saw that, that there was all these young people that wanted to see this band, so they signed it. But I don't think, look, when the album came out, well, we've told this story a million times too. It sold 5,000 copies, which we thought was yeah, yeah. unbelievable. Because we didn't of, know That's 5, a lot of drinking people. money. That's a lot of <laughs> pints, yeah. They, they sent us out. Uh, they took us out to uh, the uh, uh, Underground Railroad 
not for a meal, for appetizer. So they sent Ross. somebody that was really not part of our world to tell us that if things didn't pick up, they were going to drop us. And we thought, okay, well, we'd just be back where we were anyway. We'd be playing the bars, which we were doing. So what's the difference? So Outskirts was the first single, and yes, nobody played it. And then Try came out, and there was a mail strike. So nobody played it. And then our manager forced them to reservice it. Remember, they used to mail them out. Yeah, I was, I'm trying to figure that out. Okay, now. So, you're so, so right. So, you can't even so, imagine these so, days. So right, right, because they had to take, I guess, cassettes or LPs. No, those would be singles. They, they would, they Single, would be sending. Yeah, they would right. be sending. Uh, right. There was, a, there was some kind of, uh, some kind of version that they had to send out. So there was some kind of high quality tape right. that had to be mailed. And so the mail strike happens. You there can't was a mail get your strike happened, which we were very acquainted with because our drummer was a postman, <laughs> right? Right. So yeah. And we used more. to play with him all the time because he was on strike a lot. Yeah. So then they reserviced it, and that's when it started to hit. And when Greg, what did that like? How did you know it started to hit? I think the first time you hear it in a grocery store. Yeah. Like that's like, oh my God, isn't that something? Yeah. And then the record company starts paying more attention to you, and then you're up at the record company doing phoners. Like we used to go up there and, and do phoners for a few days, all day long. <laughs> Thanks for playing the record. Yeah. Lethbridge. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you, I was working at doing props for TV commercials. Oh, and so you uh, had a day they, job. I had, oh yeah. And there was for a long time. And uh, there was a thing on CFTR called the seven, seven at seven or six at six, one of the two. And we would always stop and bet where Tri, tri was gonna be. Because everybody was always betting against me, and it was it was in the top three for weeks, and so I just thought it was funny. I just thought it was a game, but that was changing our lives. Did you quit the job? No, not for a long time. <laughs> really, you, you still like see, to do it what? once in a while. Like yeah, him. he still shows up at the Loblaws. I, I still have my card. Yeah. 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 I know I didn't. I didn't really quit it until after Diamond Mine came out. I, you know, it didn't seem real. It just didn't seem real. It seemed wow. like we were we had fun what we were doing. I liked the balance of what we were doing. Right. I liked playing where we played. I liked the fact that it was a but I I don't think we understood. We've been doing that a long time by then. Yeah. You know, we've been doing it since 78. So we've been almost 9 years of just playing to little acclaim. Yeah. And so we didn't really understand what acclaim meant. What you know, being on being number 1 on CFTR, we thought that's great. That's a lot of fun. And I'll be at the Horseshoe on Friday. And then we started to play a lot more and travel we, a lot more. Yeah, we just got a lot of offers and Halifax yeah. and Hamilton. I think I saw you guys as bigger <laughs> road dogs than you were back then, though. You know, like I think, I think again, my perception of you guys would, you, would have been the classic band story. You get in the van, you go, 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 go. But you guys were playing clubs and Yeah, working. we were weekends and because of our, our drummer was a postman. Right. And yeah. so he had to work. I still see it. him around every now and then. Oh, yeah, the, he plays yeah. all over the Well, place. he's retired now, yeah. so he's smart. But uh, we couldn't, uh, That that's pretty much why he quit. We, he quit when we went to release Diamond Mine mm -hmm. because, as he said, I never said I was going to quit my job. And so that's when we replaced him because then the touring obligations were a lot more. And then it starts to get kind of big in, in the States, right? So there was, a, there was a, a real buzz in Canada, of course, and in, in the States. The Rolling Stone does an article on you guys in 91, I think. Chris Christopherson's talking about you guys. And then uh, can we play this clip here, so? Just tell them I'm checking out this heartbreak hotel. I ain't gonna live on lonely street no more, no more. From, uh, well, I'm not gonna say what it is. That's, uh, that, I'm here with Blue Rodeo. Jim, what did we what did we just hear? Well, that was Postcards from the Edge. That was a crazy one too because uh, that's Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep, yeah. Um, and that one had a funny beginning because we got a call saying, "Would you like to be in a Mike Nichols Meryl Streep movie?" And we're like, "Okay, but who's this from? This sounds like a joke." To be her backing and band, like to be the backing band, and they and they they auditioned us at the Diamond Club, but it was the night after the uh, Country Music Awards in Ottawa, <laughs> so I know I came back in really rough shape. I don't know That's what I had. You. I jumped off the stage, and oh, I had that oh, bad you back. Had, so we were in. So I was on painkillers. We were in. <laughs> we were in really bad shape. And I remember asking her. I was like, "When did you get in?" She said, "Oh, last night." I said, "I didn't think planes flew that late." And she looked at me like, 
You're so stupid. <laughs> uh, of course it was a private plane. Uh, but they were all really nice to us, and I, we just felt like we were contest winners. So all they did was they set us up in a bar uh, that they created down in Hollywood, and we just played whenever she had a chance. She, she'd go shoot a scene, then she'd come back. we play. Uh, we learned all sorts of great songs. Uh, you Don't Know Me, I think that was one mm -hmm. of the ones you she, gave she your hand played. You gave your hand to me, and then you say, yeah, oh, yeah. that one, yeah. She did a really nice job on that. Yeah. So we would just play. Because she was rehearsing that for another movie that she was going to be in. Was she? Yeah. I thought that the, the idea was that they wanted the band it's to seem natural. Were you jamming? They were jamming with Meryl Streep? Yeah, for yeah. days. We were there for seven or eight days. We, Tom, we'd never had our own hotel rooms. <laughs> when we were given keys, we thought, my own key? <laughs> <laughs> and we had suites. We were all running out. You should see my room. It's unbelievable. But of course, and and then it was they, it was, they were all really nice to us and they looked after us and, and we shot the scene and then they didn't like the background. So we shot it again. And then when we left, we went almost immediately to Louisville to a Motel 8, uh, Motel 6. Yeah, Motel, Motel 6. six. Eight. Not and even an 8. Not even an 8. <laughs> Motel 6. And we played at a place called Uncle Pleasant's, which very nice people there, but it was truly one of the dumpiest bars I've ever been in. So we were right. We were definitely Cinderella after midnight. <laughs> yeah, but you were also, like, again, you were getting, Chris Christopherson was talking about you guys, and then, you know, Rolling Stone was writing about your guys. Like, Greg, did you feel any, I don't know if pressure is the right word, but I guess how did that all feel to have all that happen, you know? I think there's something, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we've always sort of taken things for granted. You know, like, we just keep on rolling along, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were getting all this stuff, and it was, it, was, it was sort of fun and goofy at the same time. You know, like, when, when you hear Chris Christopherson on stage, <laughs> in the breakdown of the song, mentioning all these great inspirations in his life, and he starts going, and Blue Rodeo and talking about us from the stage in the breakdown of a song. Yeah. Well, it's, it just blows your mind. Now, that's special. That really is special. That's yeah. Really, uh, but the rest of it just sort of seems goofy, you know, and, uh, and, and very sort of humorous. Like, it's just, it's just sort of goofy fun. It sounds like you learned a lesson in, um, in New York that if you pursue the art and have a good time with your buddies as opposed to trying to become the biggest <laughs> success with the biggest manager. But things actually ended up working out because of that. If you don't measure things by success, it's a great ride. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I, think, I think both those things, I think both the things that you said are, are very true. I think the only reason that we, we ended up being successful is because we just followed the, our, our inclinations and, and music. And we wish were just, we had a great time. And we were a great band. I mean, from the beginning oh. with Basil and Bobby oh, really? and oh, Cleve, that was good. That's a that really a good band. band. Yeah. And then we, you know, we've continued with, with great members. I, I tell you, I know this sounds insincere, but after, you know, when you make a new record and you, then you listen back to the record and you're impressed by how it sounds. For me, the next stage and the thing that lasts is just how good the musicians are. Yeah. I just keep listening and think, God, that's a great part. That's really well played. Boy, that drumming is is good. I mean, I, I, we're going to talk about the new record in a second, and your band now is shit hot. Like it's yeah, yeah. it's great. I, I I saw your show at the Bud Stage uh, over the summer, and it was my first Ontario Blue Rodeo show. Oh, really? really? Yeah, I had only ever seen you guys back home, but I saw at the Bud Stage what happens when you play this song. Let's uh, take a listen. That is uh, from Five Days in July, Blue Rodeo, and hasn't hit me yet from the 1993 album. Heard you wanted to give it to the Sky Diggers. Heard you <laughs> gave it to the Sky Diggers. I did. Uh, Andy phoned me up, and he, they were at uh, Metalworks. So Andy phones me up, and, and he says, do you have any songs? And I said, well, yeah, I've got a lot of songs. We just come back from Australia, you know, so we were sort of, we sort of packed the knapsack. And uh, <laughs> so I went over to the studio, and I, and I played the song for them. And it's not really a key change, but there's just a funny little thing in it. And, and the bass player just couldn't get it. 
<laughs> Ronnie Von Johnny. Ronnie Von Johnny it just could not change. get that. Is it a key mm-hmm. change? Yeah. So the, the body ba- of the song. So the bass player couldn't get it. He couldn't. He just couldn't get it. And we, we tried a long time, and it was just like, uh, okay. So then I took the runt and put it on a Blue Rodeo record. Do they regret it now? Have you ever heard? Oh, Andy has often commented oh, on right? how funny it is. Yeah. Do they do it? Can they play it now? Um, they could probably play it now, but I don't think they do. Right. They don't do it on the shows or anything like that? The one that got so. away or anything like no. that? So when you make Five Days in July, it's the first record you make in the burn, right? It's the first record you make not we in made the at studio. His, in his house. At my house. In your house. Which, which yeah. Yeah, has, it had a barn-like quality. I thought, I, I think, <laughs> Greg, you know what? That, he's right because I'm, I imagine a barn, but I'm, it's, a, it's a house. It's, it's a house. Yeah. It's an old yeah. house. Was that, you, you, I, I want to go back to what you were saying before about, you know, when you, when you don't try to have success, that's when beautiful things kind of happen. And it feels like with this record, it wasn't about it being in a studio and being very... Like, you made it all together in your house. Right. And look, it ends up becoming the uh, probably the biggest record of your career. Yeah, it definitely had that, that little bit of fates colliding, you know? And uh, we had just finished this tour of Australia, and we spent a lot of time together, and we played a lot of music together. And uh, we came back... And we sort of had this idea of let's just go record because the band's playing great. We've got all these songs. And so we'll get Doug McClement's truck and we'll come out to my place and, and we'll make it work. And I was really infatuated. I just, with the place, you know, I just moved out there. But it was a new spot for you, wasn't it? It, it was, was a new spot for yeah. me. I'd been there maybe a year. Right. And, and, and I just thought it was the most beautiful place in the world to make music. And I've always loved those stories of bands that, you know, like Fairport Convention that go or, or traffic, they go to these places in the country and they just get wasted and make music for a few months. Yeah, Fairport went to this manor you know, out, in, out into the, in the woods in England. Yeah. The band did Big Pink. Big Pink. Yeah, yeah I've yeah. always liked that sort of communal sort of vibe when you're yeah. making records. So we went out there and we just had a, it was, again, we just sort of took it for granted. We did two songs a day. Yeah. And we just... It just came out of us like bango. Like you, 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 you had them written, but you wrote. You, yeah, yeah. They were all written and and pretty much arranged because we were sitting around on that Australian tour, just playing music. And also, it was because of the Australian tour, we'd be in like hotel rooms and dressing rooms playing acoustically all the time. Mm-hmm. And we really liked the sort of the sound of the overtones that was coming with all the acoustic playing. I'm actually playing. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and. And so we wanted to, to make that a big part of the record because we had a ton of songs. We had a whole pile of electric stuff, which sort of became nowhere to hear. And, uh, but that one just sort of worked out, you know, and, and I think I wrote something on the record about just how when energies come together like that, it's an amazing thing. And it's funny how songs sort of have that power to, to make that, to focus that energy and, and ends up being a record like five days. I, w- I wanted to t- talk about a record that I don't know if you talk about it. I, I know we've been going down some well-trodden territory here, but <laughs> I wanted to talk about a record that I really love that I don't know if you talk about enough. Can you play the next clip? Well, it would be great to be so strong Never needed anybody else get along But we're so scared of the silence So that's from 2002, Palace of Gold, uh, Bulletproof from that record with uh, Blue Rodeo. So Bob Egan's in the band at this point. Yep. He had been in, in Wilco before that. Um, you, you do tours with folks like the Sadies, like Rick White from um, Eric's Trip is involved on the tours. And like it, it kind of makes me think about where you guys sort of are now, which kind of leads us to the new record of like Blue Rodeo, in my mind, how do I put this? Goes from being like a band to like a community. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, yeah. I think that was, especially on that record, it was a conscious choice. Of stealing to, from everyone we played. Well, that's yeah, true. <laughs> but, that's you know, why we keep good talented yeah, people yeah, around if us. If we go <laughs> back to, to five days, five days we invited all our friends to come out to Greg's place. So people were tenting, people were staying over, sleeping in their cars, people coming in and out of the house. We never ruined a take. There were dogs there. 
They're, yeah, on songs you can hear doors yeah. opening, dogs oh, yeah. barking. They never ruined a take. People coming in and out of a room in which we were recording. And you wanted it. You liked it. You, you wanted That's to keep it. what we wanted to. We wanted to have an enjoyable environment because we were tired of being stuck in studios and under the gun about money and time. And so we just wanted to do something that was fun. And when we'd made Palace of Gold, well, I, I know I had just read the Stax book. And, and the thing that, that really struck me about Stax was everything was from the neighborhood. It's like if you walked in there and you had a tape, they were going to listen to it and maybe they'd take you right in the back and they'd record that. And I love the fact that we, you know, prior to that, the idea was go to Los Angeles or go to New Orleans and then use those musicians. I thought we know everybody up here. Yeah. We know string players. We know horn players. We know everybody. So let's just, let's make this grand statement, but let's make it with everybody we know. Let's use our own resources. And of course, I think it, turned a corner for us because all those people were great. Richard Underhill put his horns together and Anne Lindsay, I think. Put was the that the first together. record at the Woodshed for us? That was the first record at the Woodshed, yes. Right. It was, a, it was, it was not easy because it was a brand new studio. So it right. was a little bit of a mess because we weren't, weren't totally set up. But even that was, even that was, a, was a, uh, a, a step towards making our own community because we, we actually built a studio not just for ourselves, but for a lot of the people that we knew in bands that couldn't afford the way studios were at that time. I remember thinking of the Skydiggers who have never worked in our studio in all the years. But we thought, you know, like you guys are just at that level where you, you can't spend $1,500 a day to be in a studio, so come here. I have been racking my brain as to why I thought, what, what I'm imagining for five days why I imagined Greg's house to be that way. Like, how did I get that wrong? And I'm realizing I was imagining the woodshed. I was imagining... Which is, a, which yeah. is all the all barn board on the inside. Which yeah. looks like my house. Yes. Yeah, but it just looks like her house. See? <laughs> yeah. See? Yeah. Only like, cleaner. More do- <laughs> <laughs> so, Greg, um, that sort of brings us to this record. Um, where were you, uh, not physically, but sort of metaphysically, before this record started coming together? Um, the COVID had been... A nice break for my ears. Right. I should say for people, um, tinnitus is... Well, it's, it's, it's more than tinnitus. It's yeah. also just the compression that happens in my ears when, uh, when volumes and frequencies are pounded in my head. So, you know, I get the migraines and it takes me out of the loop completely. And it makes me miserable because I can't play guitar, I can't write, I can't sing. And I just sort of sit and, and deal with, with migraines. Jesus. And uh, so with all that time off, my head was fine, and I was just writing and writing and writing, and I had a great bubble out in near me w- with uh, Jimmy Boskill, Ian McEwen, and James McKenty. And Jimmy had just opened a new studio, and I had just finished doing all the promo for the uh, Share the Love record, and... I had all these songs, and I went into Jimmy's studio, and we set up, and we recorded uh, When You Were Wild. And, and I just thought, well, I think for a lot of us, we just love being in the studio. I think that's why I write so many songs. I just love the process of sitting with a group of musicians and having the song take form. Not like everybody loves that, you know. Most, a lot of people love the road but hate the studio, you know. I'm the opposite. I, I don't really care about the road at all. It doesn't do much for me. Right. But just sitting with people and playing guitars and recording, that is totally magical to me. And, and uh, so I didn't really want to let go. And so that afternoon while we were doing When You Were Wild, I phoned Jim up. And we had talked about a, a year before about maybe thinking about doing a record. But I just sort of said, okay, let's go. I, I've started. And, you know, and, uh, and Jim, of course, said, yeah, I'm, I'm in the middle of a solo record, but... I'm game, let's go. And is the solo record... Help me understand this. So the, the, the record is... <laughs> yeah, help us, Jim. <laughs> I'm no, help. no, no, hold I'm on. Gonna help my, us. You're wrong. I'm going to do right about my that. best here. So the, the, it's a Blue Rodeo record done by two... I mean, this is kind of why... I was sort of building to this with the community thing, right? Mm-hmm. That Blue Rodeo is not even so much of a band to me anymore. It's a community of musicians and a band that goes on the road. The record is Greg and a one band... In your studio. No, I was in Coburg at Jimmy Boskill's studio. It's you and your band at, in Coburg. Yeah. Not a burn. Jim in his 
in the, the woodshed. In the woodshed. Yeah. And those two records together are a blue rodeo right. record. But they, but they, um, so I was just working with Colin, Colin Cripps, Colin Cripps yeah. and Tim Vesley. So yeah. we, we, the three of us have made a lot of music together. And I was doing my solo record, but in this most unusual way. Like where Greg was actually with musicians together, I was just, Colin and I would play acoustic guitar to a drum beat we found on the internet. And then we would gradually, bring in one band member at a time and they would replace pieces and then we'd build it from there. So that seemed to work. And when Greg called me and said, well, let's make a record, I've never been in that position before. I've never been in the position where I have songs written for a solo record and now I have to start again and write because I don't want to overlap and I don't want to, there to be any accusations from him that maybe I've kept something for myself that I could have. So I just started again, started writing and then the process worked for me, you know, just to have Glenn come in by himself. Like, we've never done this. We, we usually play together and maybe we'll replace pieces. But I think that what happens when you all play together is you go for this overall vibe. And when you think you've got it, you really stick with it. And sometimes an individual member say, well, I don't really like what I played on that or I don't really like the sound of my drums. I'm like, dude, we can't go back at this point. Right. But the, the opposite is true now. It's like, Glenn was there by himself. It's like, take all the time you want. <laughs> and and it was great to watch. I mean, I've, you know, I've always said that hell for me is is more drum checks. But <laughs> truly, watching him play and watching him change, you know, the hi hats or things that would have driven me crazy before, is it was fascinating. Because I didn't know, and I hope you don't mind me saying so, I didn't know if I'd get the chance to talk to the two of you again ever. Well, ever for one, yeah, because <laughs> I thought they'd get rid of me. But, um, but I, I, I thought um, I didn't know if there'd be another Blue Rodeo record. You know, I didn't. Well, I don't think we were sure either. Well, like five years ago, when I sort of took the powder, um, I didn't think I'd be uh, doing a Blue Rodeo record. You know, I thought I was retired. Yeah, sort of play a few shows a year, and and that was it. But uh, we sort of do have the COVID to thank. I know that's a strange thing. No, but yeah. But whatever whatever sort of um, limitations it brought to people's lives, it sort of, uh, it, for some strange reason, it made us creative and cooperative. And is this like a new model for how Blue Rodeo can continue on? I think that what, you know, what to just, to, just to say further what Greg said, is that it made us do everything in much more measured time. And yeah. instead of rolling together, let's get a record, let's get a tour, let's do all this kind of stuff. We don't need to do that. We've, we have a million songs and, and we have lots of touring opportunities. So I think that just slowing down and doing it piece by piece, I don't know. It will be hard to not follow some of the, the uh, model that we just used because it was so successful. I mean, we have two separate, Greg and I were not ever <laughs> in the studio together. But do Never. You, do you still but feel we'd like... send things back and forth, yeah. and also we'd send messengers. You know, Basil, go out there, see what he's, see what's going on <laughs> out there. Uh, is he crazy? Is it everything all right? And so he'd come back and say, yeah, "It's great out there." So, you know, it was, it was fun to do. And Basil's uh, the intermediary, going back Basil's and forth the, between. Basil's the guy. Basil's Buddha. You know. What does that tell you though? That Basil is the is the is the common in he's the Venn diagram. Been. He's you know? always been. <laughs> he's always been. But are you still like? Are you still, uh, you know, Lennon and McCartney? Cuddy and Keeler on records like this, do you still feel that way, you know? Well, I think that this record worked out like that. I think that's what it feels like to me. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, of intertwining of our songs. And uh, I think it follows a certain model that Blue Rodeo has always followed. Way more Greg songs than mine, but uh, somehow they all seem to fit <laughs> together. The quantity over quality, eh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the important thing is you're letting it go. See, this is the, this is the important thing. <laughs> With every day. Um, letting go is a big part of, of making the record. Letting go of previously conceived ideas of how you make music. Yeah. And, and letting go of expectations of what you thought you were going to get. You know, you just had to, you know, here it is, and we'll just see how it works out. So that was quite rewarding because we didn't know where it was going to go. Yeah. And then when you did the shows the summer... I went to the, like I said, there was the first Ontario show I'd ever seen you guys do. It is, I'm not to discount anything you ever do in any other part of the country. It's a trip to see you guys in Ontario. 
it's wild to see yeah, how much you mean to people here. <laughs> and nice. I mean, you are, you're like the great big sea of Ontario. Oh, you <laughs> nasty bitch. <laughs> that was terrible. Do you have that written down? Yeah, no, no, that's just... Uh, you just, you just, just came right off, did it? Alan, the, Alan pays him to say yeah, yeah. Newfoundland Mafia. Here. So, um, <laughs> that's a good one. When you were on stage, Greg, and you did... Um, uh, it hasn't hit me yet. You guys walked away from the microphones. Oh, actually, you did... The, the audience sang the verse and the chorus. Right. How, after COVID, after everything we just talked about, how did that feel? Well, it, it, it's fantastic. It's always been a joy to sing that song. But to have them sing it for you, man. But they have been for a few years. Yeah. Like the audience it lets her go, you know, like, and that's what I would say. Well, let's give her. And I, I like the... Because I know the feeling, the great feeling it is to sing at the top of your lungs. And it's such, it's such a joyous thing. You know, it's the breathing, it's, it's the opening of the sinuses, it's everything about it. And everybody, you should sing more often. That's, <laughs> that's all you have to do. But, but, uh, and I'll, well then, sing and walk. I'll, I'll say it. It, is, it was one of the most moving outpourings of love I have ever seen in concert. Oh. Wow. It really was because it was. You don't get out much. No, I don't. No, no. <laughs> Come on. No, I mainly You've play. You've probably been on the other end. Of I it. normally play Irish music where all of our songs are about people dying. So, yeah. you know, there's not a lot of singing along to that one. But I mean it. I was on the way in and people were coming up to me and, you know, they knew me from the show and all, and all this other stuff. And they, oh, you must be excited. To, oh, my God, I can't wait. Because we didn't think it was going to happen because there was a storm that oh, day. Oh, there was a storm. Right. That's a right. storm. And they said, I just, I've been waiting so long for this. I've been waiting so long for this. This is my first show back. Everyone was saying the same thing to me. This is my first show back. It's, it is, it has been really amazing to go back and play because, because of that feeling that people have, that they've been released from something and they, they are so happy to be with each other, not just for, with us, but with each other. I, you know, I, I am grateful to you for talking to me about the road, you know, all the way up. I feel like I didn't, I didn't know I'd get that out of this interview about, you know, you grind and you hustle. And I, I can relate to it. You grind and you hustle, you grind and you hustle, you grind and you hustle. It's, it's when you let go that beautiful things kind of happen. But you made a great record too. And, and thanks for coming in. Thank you very much, Tom. Our pleasure. Thanks, thanks for having us in. Greg, Greg Keeler and Jim Cuddy from Blue Rodeo are my guests. Uh, they've just released their 16th album, Many a Mile.